I'm really glad we could listen to that song twice. I don't have anything more that I really want to say about the topic of resiliency. Some of the traits emotionally that are associated with resilient people is, the first one is that they know the parameters. They know their boundaries. They know where the end of their hand stops and where the air or other people's presence begins. And other characteristics is of resilient people that they, they're able to practice acceptance that whatever comes down the highway, there's a certain ability to know that there's more to all this. There are many other characteristics of resilient people. They know that they don't have all the answers. And interestingly, when researchers take this, they find that these people considered more resilient than, than others are able to sit in silence. Well, isn't that interesting? With that, I will stop and say this is Dr. Albert Rossi for Ancient Faith Radio saying once again, I and you, the listener, are called to support Ancient Faith Radio as best we can with our prayer and with our finances. Dr. Rossi is the author of the Ancient Faith Publishing book, Becoming a Healing Presence, available at store.ancientfaith.com. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. Glory to Jesus Christ, glory forever. You're listening to AncientFaithRadio.com. He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him. And they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48 verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Welcome back to the Lord of Spirits podcast. It is one of all of our favorite things where we look at all that stuff that's integral to Christianity, but that does not fit into a materialist worldview because that worldview is garbage. I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and my co-host is Father Stephen DeYoung, who's with me from Lafayette, Louisiana. And if you're listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO. That's 855-237-2346. Matushka Trudy, who is just back from COVID land. Yay! We'll be taking your calls tonight. We will get to your calls in the second part of today's show. So, in our last two episodes, we talked about sacred geography, how the reality of sacred spiritual place overlaps material place, including paradise, which is the mountain of God. And last time we talked about the underworld. This episode is titled The Lord of Spirits goes to hell, which some people apparently thought was a repeat of last time, but it is not. We are talking about what happens when the Lord of Spirits himself, that is the incarnate Son and Word of God, Jesus Christ, makes the journey into the underworld. That journey is a major theme of the Holy Week and Pascha services that for the Orthodox Church are coming up this very next week in real time. So this is also our Holy Week and Pascha special. I feel like it. we should call it like our season finale, but we're not, <laughs> we're not stopping. But um, <clears throat> so to begin our journey tonight, we're going to do what we almost always do. We're going to take a trip back 
thousands of years. And we're going to arrive at an ancient ruined city in the Levant in northwestern Syria near the modern city of Latakia. That's right. We're heading back to Ugarit. And that means we're going to be talking about our old adversary, Baal. So, Father Stephen, take us to Ugarit. You got it. You betcha. <laughs> um, wow. That's the tourism slogan. <laughs> yeah, right. For people from the upper Midwest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, say yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Right. Well, as you as you said, uh, this is a city that has not been around in a long, long time. Uh, right. Like 4,000 years, roughly? Or almost uh, five, more than 5,000, more than 5,000. No, no, no. It 3, hasn't 000. been around for Whatever. about, yeah, for about 3,200. But there we go, um, yeah. uh, roughly, yeah, <laughs> give or take. Um, but uh, before that, it was around for a long time. Uh, Ugarit was uh, originally built, or settled, I should say, around, uh, well, it was early in the Neolithic period. We won't get into that again. Uh, the okay. walls seem to have been built around 6,000 BC. Oh, uh, wow. And so again, it was pretty old. Right. And, and again, you know, if these dates are problematic to you, adjust however you need to. But yeah. that's the, the current archaeological dating of when the walls were built. Uh, and then uh, Ugarit was destroyed circa uh, 1180 BC. Hmm. Uh, so this is a city that existed for thousands of years, but thousands of years, thousands of years ago. And right. And it wasn't rebuilt. Uh, it was pretty much plowed over. And it was not discovered until the middle of the 20th century uh, wow. that the city was even there. Now, were there indications? I mean, did people know that it had existed they just didn't know where it was not some kind of records or not really oh wow um because it's in an area that's now called rashamra and uh when it was found a new language was discovered uh and uh named ugaritic because yeah ugarit (laughs) right (laughs) um but uh which is a a uh northwestern semitic language uh, meaning it's sort of a close cousin to Hebrew. It's right. another one of the dialects that emerged from old Canaanite oh, uh, around the time that the city was being destroyed, actually. Um, but it's uh, unlike uh, biblical Hebrew, it's not written with the Phoenician alphabetic script. It hmm. was written with the cuneiform script that's used for Akkadian and other uh, early Semitic languages. So phonetically, like if you read it in transliteration and you know Hebrew, um, well, if you've studied any Semitic languages, even Arabic, even modern Arabic, um, you, you know, basically the consonantal structure of most of the vocabulary. You're right. So you, right. the differences right. between Semitic languages are mainly vocalization, meaning vowels. Right. Uh, so, in transliteration, if you if you're good with Hebrew and Aramaic, you can pick up Ugaritic really quickly. Um, to read it in the cuneiform script, you have to learn the cuneiform script, which is yeah. a lot more difficult. I can say from right. firsthand attempts, right? Because uh, <laughs> you've got a, a couple hundred symbols to learn, uh, I, I, yeah, not like I, I, twenty-two I, letters. I remember when I was you know a preteen seeing seeing that alphabet and going, "That's really cool," and then like learning three symbols and then giving up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they all look fairly similar. They're not radically right. different from one another. Yeah. Um, so, um, but the, the reason the language was so important is there are literally a ton of Hebrew words uh, that we did not know what they meant. Yeah. Because the only texts we had them in were sort of scattered parts of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, so uh, they just made guesses when they would translate. Right, and that's why yeah. sometimes if you compare any of the modern translations of the Old Testament to parts of, like, the King James Version, uh, 
you'll see that they're sometimes radically different. And you're like, yeah. what is happening there? And it's because <laughs> the King James translators were doing their best. They were right. looking at the Latin and they were looking at the Greek and kind of going, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> and there are places even in the Greek translation where you could tell the rabbis centuries later were kind of looking at it and going, uh, you know, <laughs> and kind of approximating. Um, right, right. So, is that where we and, get the donkey centaurs? <laughs> sort of, yes. Sort actually. of, okay, okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to throw um, that out there for people. Donkeys that's centaurs. a topic for another time, probably Indeed. when we talk about vampires. Yeah, um, just to right. further tease it. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so you get a lot of weird things. You get, you know, the edge of the bed of Damascus versus a lion cub in one place. There's, there's a lot of really interesting things that happens. But so... We found these same words, albeit vocalized a little differently, in these Ugaritic texts. And so that gave us, like, a few dozen more examples. Yeah, and it's piles and piles of clay tablets, right? Vocabulary usage, right. Because this is all written on fire clay tablets. But these fire clay tablets uh, from the ancient Near East, once they fired them, they're almost indestructible. Like, if you hurled one at your floor, you'd dent your floor. Nice. Before you'd break the tablet. Um, that's really convenient. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we have so many. Um, yeah. But I guess most a... of them are like useless, right? Most of them are like shopping lists and whatever, right? Right. Right. And so <laughs> if there are several places, oh, listener, if, if you want to study further, there are several places where you could get a full ride to get a PhD in Sumeriology in the United States. Uh, People writing because, this down right now. I yes, can tell. There, there are endowments <laughs> and stuff for people to translate all this stuff. Yeah. And there aren't enough people to do it. And part of it is that you end up translating, you know, a hundred grocery lists and trade documents before you get to something interesting. But they're still turning up interesting things. A few years ago, I mean, five or ten years ago, they discovered a whole new version of the flood story. Oh, nice. On a Babylonian tablet. So this stuff's... So there is interesting stuff there. You just got to be willing to get into the weeds and to learn cuneiform and and do some language study. Um, Yeah. But so the reason we're talking about this is one set of tablets in particular. Yeah. uh, So it's not just relevant to biblical studies, but there's also... Broadly. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. right, Broadly, right. Yeah. (laughs) Right. But but there's also the... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, one of those has been named by us the Bale Cycle, uh, because cycle because it's like an epic cycle. It's like an epic poetry cycle, uh, and uh, Bale because he's the main character. Uh, so this is we get all through the Old Testament. We see Baal worshippers, prophets of Baal. Uh, altars built to Baal. They're kind of the bad guys through most of the books of the kingdoms or first and second Samuel and first and second Kings um, and first and second Chronicles. Uh, you see them turn up in the prophets. Uh, so we knew about Baal. We knew, uh, like, for example, Queen Jezebel, who marries King Ahab in the northern kingdom of Israel, is from. Uh, the Phoenician kingdom, which is in what's now Lebanon, right? So we knew she brought the Baal worship down from there. Uh, so we knew this religion's there, but yeah. this is the first time with these these Ugaritic texts, including the Baal cycle, that we got sort of the other side of that, where we got texts written by Baal worshippers for Baal worshippers. Right? Yeah. <laughs> instead of the other, instead of uh, condemning Baal worship. So we're getting to see how their religion looked from the inside. Um, and there's lots of ritual texts and lots of other stuff. But the Baal cycle is what we're uh, we're here to talk about tonight. And Baal himself, uh, Baal is both a title and a name of a god. Right. Uh, so the word Baal or Baal uh, is just the word for lord or master. Right. Right. Um, and uh, th- that creates some funny things for people who don't know that. So the, the founder, for example, of, of Kabbalistic Judaism is the, the Baal Shem Tov. 
and you're like, wait, Baal? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, a, a rabbi or whatever named Baal. But they were... Uh, but it just means the, Lord. It's the Aramaic word for master, right? The right. same way that we use we use various versions of master when we address bishops, they did for rabbis, right? Sure. Uh, in Aramaic. Uh, there's also a place in uh, the Minor Prophets where Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, previously you knew me as Baal, but now you know me as... Uh, as husband, which of course, our German uh, what nineteenth <laughs> century German friends jumped all over. Oh, see, look, uh, yeah, but, right. They were polytheists, right? They if, worshipped if, Baal. If, yeah, they're Baal worshippers. He's admitting it. Um, but uh, if you if you read it in context, it's saying previously you knew me as master, now you know me as husband. He's talking about the relationship with Israel. That he's not yeah. just their lord, but he's also he also loves them um, and cares for them. Um, so, yeah, but when we talk about Baal, like when you have the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel with the prophet Elijah, the yes. Baal they're worshiping is a specific guy who is just referred to as Baal. And that's the yeah. person who the Baal cycle is about. His father's name is El, which is just which the just word means for God. A God, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's... There's the the, the 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 Most High God is named God, and His Son is named Lord. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, um, and that's not coincidental, right? Hmm. The idea that you have Most High God and then a Son. We talked about this a little in in uh, a couple of previous episodes, but oh yeah, right. Repeating here, yeah, like early, early on, some of our early episodes, right? That this is this is a pattern you see throughout ancient religion is that the Most High God is the father to a son, a divine son who presides over the divine council, right? Right, and then that sets up in almost every single ancient mythology, not all of them, I think, but in almost every single one, what's referred to as the succession myth, where you've got a son or some kind of lesser god uh, overthrowing his father or overthrowing some greater gods. I mean, the details slide around a little bit, depending on which one you're looking at. Um, And uh, that's in the Baal cycle, which until, what was it, the 1960s, 1970s? No one had right. known those details for over 3,000 years. Right, about right. Baal. About, about Baal, Baal in, in particular. Right. Yes, yeah, oh, you've got the right. succession myth in many mythologies. Right, so you've got uh, Zeus but, killing Cronus, Cronus casting, uh, Odin yeah, killing yeah. his father. Right, I mean. Right, right, yep. <laughs> right, all the way through. So, and we talked about that in terms of uh, the way the devil is portrayed in the prophets in particular. Exactly. exactly. In the Old Testament. That it's sort of correcting the record that, well, yeah, you you maybe tried, but you didn't succeed in making yeah. yourself the most high God, right? Right. In in, um, in pagan myths, generally there's a success that happens there, but right, yeah, yeah, right, right. And right. so uh, this is what the story of the Bale cycle primarily is. Uh, right. The story of the Bale cycle, sort of the through line of the epic cycle, is this is the story of Bale's sort of insurrection. Yeah, um, and uh, his father. We talked before also how in in after a certain point in history, in all of these um, ancient religions, the uh, all these forms of ancient religion, uh, the the Most High God sort of recedes off into the distance, right? Uh, and you can really see this in the Baal cycle because technically, Baal's revolt is to make his father El the Most High God. And for him to preside in the council, but El like doesn't do much of anything. Yeah, right. Because so Baal is actually <laughs> revolting against uh, Yam and Nahar, right? Who are the right. the gods of the ocean and the rivers, respectively. And I think I think I, I think even in modern Arabic, Nahar means river. Write in. Let us yeah. know if I got that wrong. Right. Uh, Yam. <laughs> Yam is the word for sea or ocean. We talked about how that rep, that's chaos, right? Right. Um, and he's the most high god at the beginning of the Baal cycle. He's the one in right. charge. And then Nahar is referred to as the prince. So yeah, he's so, the one, the right. son who presides in the... The idea is to get a new dynasty in there, essentially. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. 
Right, right. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, especially for people who have read Father Stephen's blog, you might have heard some of this before, almost certainly. But there's this um, very dramatic moment in the Bale cycle where Bale goes up on, is it Mount Hermon? Am I remembering that correctly? No, that's not. No, it's no. Mount, Mount Zaphon with Bale. Zaphon, yeah, okay. Well, let's, wait, let's, let's wait and get to that in a sec. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> don't, don't want to spoil it yet. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm just so the, excited. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hold your horses, man. Keep it straight. Right. <laughs> um, the so uh, one of the primary things that the Bale cycle illuminates is one of the Psalms. Right. This is Psalm 24 in the traditional Hebrew numbering. Psalm 23 in the traditional Greek numbering. Okay. Um, all right. And yeah. so this. Once we found the Bale cycle, we could see that this psalm, this Hebrew psalm, uh, is sort of a response right. to the Bale cycle. It, it, <laughs> right. it directly directly references it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And, right. and okay. so in, in yeah. Um, but one more thing about sort of the arc of the Bale cycle before okay. we read the psalm. Um, so just again to give the broad arc. Right. It, in the, the broad arc of the Bale cycle, the broad arc of the action, uh, Bale decides he's going to take charge and, and, and put his dad in charge. So he's going to overthrow uh, Yam and Nahar. Uh, so he sets out uh, to stage this sort of rebellion. And he totally wins <laughs> by a lot. Yes. Uh, but decides to go to the underworld after he totally wins. Yeah, and, and gets stayed there. Yeah, and when he when he goes to the underworld, he runs into Moat, the god of death, who we're going to be seeing a lot of tonight, and gets in a fight with Moat, which he also totally wins. Uh, but even though he totally wins, he decides to just stay in Sheol uh, and, and, and take up residence there. Right. So that's sort of the broad strokes. Yeah, of the yeah. story that the Baal worshippers were telling themselves in their pro-devil propaganda. Uh, so now, <laughs> let's go ahead and look at this all. <laughs> <laughs> Starting to give it away now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is Psalm 24. You know, people, you you, you should recognize a lot of this. Um, but I'm just going to read the whole psalm to you. It's only 10 verses long. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Okay, everybody, you, especially if you're Orthodox, you've heard this psalm. You've, you've definitely heard it. But, you know, if you're a Christian, if you read the Bible at all, you know, this is a psalm you should know. It's Psalm 24. All right. Well, let's talk about all the cool things that are happening in this <laughs> psalm with regards to the Baal cycle. It's unbelievable. You guys are not going to believe this. You're not going to believe it. Even if you've read, you know, the, the, the relevant post from Father Stephen's blog, which talks about some of this. It doesn't talk about all of it. But uh, let's let's talk about a lot more of it. So yeah. first one. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, you read the, the King James Version. Because, the King James, uh, yes. If it's which good I enough just... for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for us. Right. Um, and <laughs> so... there, There's someone out there, by the way, who doesn't like it when I say, right? I feel like yeah. I'm going to say it a lot more tonight. Probably. <laughs> just Probably. to mess with that guy. Um... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's verse such, one. Okay, the such, earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Such resentment is not appropriate for Lent. That's true. Think, uh, that's true. That's okay. true. With all due respect, I'm getting um, a little. Pun I'm getting a little punchy here at the end of the sixth <laughs> week of Lent. Okay, so <laughs> so the, the, I mentioned that because um, there are some things that are kind of obscured by English translation, um, right? 
This right. isn't so much mistranslated as just sort of obscured. And so one of the big ones right off the bat is that uh, English Bibles, by and large, with some exceptions, uh, don't translate Yahweh as Yahweh. Yeah, <laughs> right? it's usually Lord. They put Lord in typically. all caps. In right. all caps, yeah. So you get the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but it's really the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof. Right. And why I'm saying that's important is that sometimes what the text is saying, and we're going to see this over and over again tonight, <laughs> that's, sometimes what the text is directly asserting is that things that the pagan nations were saying about their gods are actually true of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and right. not of those pagan gods. Yeah, yeah. Right? So and, there's a lot of smack talk, really, right. <laughs> right. going on in the Bible, frankly. Right. So, but if you like, don't... No, trans not, not your guy. No. Right. <laughs> you, if you don't translate that, the name, right, then you kind of lose on that. You lose out on that idea, right? So if you're saying, you know, no, uh, Charles is king, right? Like, you, you, as opposed to somebody else, right? Right. <laughs> He's king, right. not this other guy. Whereas if you just say, no, the king is king. Yeah. Right, you right. don't get the, you know, right? It's like, no, this is the, right? So that begins right away in verse 1. Right. Where it says, right, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Right. It's the earth is Yahweh's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. It the world and else. they that dwell therein. Right. Meaning the world, the creation, the cosmos and everything in it belongs to Yahweh, not to anyone else. Right. Right. He's placing right. a claim, personal claim on it. That's why I think it's appropriate here to point out the personal name. And, uh, Eagle-eared, that's not a phrase. What ear? What would be ears? Eagle-eyed, right? What's the ear equivalent? <laughs> I don't know. dog ear uh, doesn't work. I don't anyway. Know. I don't uh. know. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of animals that have good hearing, but... Yes, attentive listeners amongst yeah. our <laughs> listeners uh, who have been to an Orthodox funeral service might uh, recognize that, that right. verse. That's said right when the priest anoints the body with oil and probably puts some ash or dirt, depending on the tradition. Uh, right, it's usually done uh, right at the end of the funeral service, or right, sometimes right it's the, done right before the burial. Right, right uh, before the burial, right before the casket is sealed and the burial takes place. Yeah, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the round world, and all they that dwell therein. Right, that's the that's the version that's in my head anyway. Right, and so just hearing that in English, it might not be clear what any of that has to do with the fact that you're burying somebody. Right. Except maybe it has something to do with dirt. You're putting it in the earth, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Um, right. Right. But the, the point here, if you, once we understand what the verse is doing, right, the, the earth, it's saying that, that the cosmos and everyone in it, right, every sentient being in it belongs to Yahweh and no one else. Right? right. Then you understand that when we do this in the funeral service, we're asserting a claim. Yeah, that this person is not being handed over to the God of death. This person belongs to Yahweh. Right. Even though he's about to go into the earth, he still belongs to Yahweh. He right. still belongs to the one true God. Right. So that's that's where it starts. <laughs> right. So right off the bat, shots fired. <laughs> right. <laughs> that no, all of this belongs to to Yahweh and no one else. Verse two starts with four, right? It's because. Right? Yeah, because. Why? Why does it all belong to him? Because he founded it. Because he built it. Right? <laughs> so it's his. He made it. Um and he did that uh by founding it upon the seas, which is Yom. which is the word yam yam and established it upon the floods is how the king james does it and floods is nahar what do you know right? so he built it on top of yam and nahar right which is uh basically saying remember now Baal is going up against yam and nahar to try to defeat them so he can set his dad and himself up 
as the new dynasty uh, up on the mountain. But but what God is saying here through this psalm prophetically is, no, 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 no. I'm the one who conquered the chaos of the oceans and the seas and the rivers, and I built my world on top of them, <laughs> you know, which is, a, a, you know, you got that, that image of sort of submission and defeat, right? You know, just like if you level a city and then build your, your new city up on top of it, that's what's going on here. So again, it's a comment on the bail cycle. Right. You know, that no, you want, no, yeah. If you want power over chaos, right? He didn't have to defeat it and fight it. Right. The image is of him laying the foundation for a building on the ocean. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So this is, you get the same kind of imagery in the book of Revelation at the end. Hmm. Uh, the sea like glass. Yeah. It just obeys him. Right. It's yeah. just flat. Right. <laughs> like solid. Uh, instead of chaotic and choppy and, and out of control. So it all belongs to Yahweh, the God of Israel, because he created it. Right. And he subjected the forces of chaos to order when he created uh, as we saw when we talked about Genesis 1 at a couple of points. Um, yeah. So then uh, verse 3, the smack talk continues. Right? <laughs> the smack uh, talk continues. <laughs> right? So, because it says, uh, it asks the rhetorical question, who shall ascend the, literally, mountain? Who will ascend yeah, the, the mountain hill. of Yahweh? Right? This is the Har Moed. This is the mountain. This is paradise that we talked about. The Mount of Assembly. Right, the place where everyone meets. Who will? Who's going to go up the mountain? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Right, the holy place, the holy space of paradise. Right, who's going to come into paradise? Yeah, not you, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> right. Not Baal. <laughs> right. Not Baal. Yeah, exactly. Not the devil who rebelled. He can't go back. He's gone. Yeah. He's thrown out. He's done. Right. It's permanent. right. Right. He's in the underworld and he's staying there. Right. Right. And yeah, but this is connected again, once again, back to the funeral, because who's going to ascend this person by God's grace that you're burying in the ground? They're going to ascend the mountain of God. Right. Baal and doesn't get to do it. This guy does. Verse four, verses four and five. He that hath right. clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully, right. he shall receive the blessing Faith. from Yahweh. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Yeah. Um, so he's the one, and that righteousness is literally he will receive justification for all of it, right? He will, he's the one who will be put in order. That's that creation language. The same way that, that Yahweh put the creation in order and restored them and, or, and, and built them and blessed them, he's going to do that to this human uh, who does not belong. Uh, to Baal, and he's going to do it instead of Baal. Uh, so this is that replacement idea uh, going on and sort of being rubbed in his uh, in his face. Right, and this <laughs> and yeah, and so then this it's clear then that this understanding of what this psalm is for is preserved in Orthodox liturgical practice, right? By virtue of it being used in the funeral, right, right, yeah. And now, <laughs> as we come here, to we the go last, the last four verses. Uh, are also preserved in Orthodox liturgical practice. Yeah. Um, that's starting in verse 7. The lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And there's this dialogue, right, of who is this king of glory? And it's Yahweh strong and mighty, Yahweh mighty in battle. Then again, lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up. Everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? Yahweh Sabaot. That's the Lord yeah. of Hosts. <laughs> Yahweh right. Sabaot. Uh, Yahweh of Armies, as we talked about before. Also known as the Lord of Spirits. Right. <laughs> he is He's... the King of Glory. So again, right. the name is important. He is the King of Glory, not anybody else. Right. Right. Not anybody else. Um, and so this, these verses. Uh, which seem kind of weird, taken by themselves. Yeah. Right? Because gates don't have heads. Right. They can't it, lift them, per se. Yeah. Yeah. Or it doesn't ask seem to have. questions. Ha it doesn't seem to have. <laughs> it, on its face, it doesn't seem to have much to do with the six verses that came before. Right. Yeah. Right. 
And so uh, it's interesting but... sometimes to go and look at <laughs> look at some of the weird exegesis of this you get from uh, certain sources our, our in friends the early and other modern groups. period. Yeah. Yeah. In the early modern periods of the 16th and 17th centuries. But I'll leave that to, to others. Um, but they didn't have the bail cycle. And uh, in the bail cycle, and this is, I'll, I'll give you the reference. <laughs> That's, so this is bail, uh, Roman numeral one period, Roman numeral two period, 24 through 29. And the way that works is that means it's tablet one, column two, uh, lines 24 through 29. So if you're one of the folks out there who knows cuneiform, you could actually go look at the tablet and find this. Uh, otherwise, you could find it in a critical edition uh, with that information. Um, there is this episode during uh, Bale's Rebellion uh, in which uh, a group of angels, it's malak, it's the word for angel, but it could all, which also means messenger, of course, um, hmm. come from... Uh, Yam and Nahar, because they've heard rumblings uh, that Baal is up to something. <laughs> right? <laughs> and right. Baal is sort of being a rabble rouser on Mount Zaphon amongst the, uh, the other gods and is trying to get them to join his rebellion. And so these messengers come uh, to say, hey, we heard there's something brewing here. You better not try anything, basically. Right. Uh, and uh, when they come and they enter the room, right, the representatives of Yama Nahar enter the room, all of the gods who are sitting on their, their little thrones, they all sort of put their heads between their legs. Yeah, uh, like, like don't, don't hurt us. Prostrate We're sorry. Themselves. We're not with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they right. all sort of wimp out. And so Bale's sort of standing there by himself. So then Bale has his sort of brave heart moment where he gives his speech, <laughs> right? Uh, he's going to give his speech. He's going to rally the troops. He's going to tell the other gods, look, man, no, we can do this. You know, they can take our lives. They'll never take our freedom. <laughs> you can't handle the truth, etc." cetera. Um, and it's not this day. <laughs> yeah, so, right. <laughs> um, so he goes to, to, to give this speech, and he begins it, because they all have their heads between their legs, by saying, lift up your heads, O ye gods. Yeah. And be yeah. lifted up as he gives this sort of rousing speech about how, you know, we're going to go to Delaware, and then we're going to go to Pennsylvania, and then we're going to go to... <laughs> and then he screams. Anyway. Um, there's a reference for all the Gen Xers out there. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> Right, so these are the words with which, in the Baal cycle, Baal rallies the other gods in his rebellion to go to victory. Yeah, okay. lift up your heads, guys. Right. I've got this. And so, what we see in the Psalm is that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is throwing those words back yeah. at Baal. <laughs> He's throwing those words yeah. back at Baal slash the devil, who even though he totally won twice, is some, <laughs> for some reason down in the underworld. Um, I meant that. I meant to do that, guys. Yeah. Uh, is throwing it back at him, right? He's throwing it back at his face, the, ver the very words that he used. Um, so then the question is, well, why is it gates right. rather than gods, right? And this is related to a little bit of what we talked about last time. This palace in Sheol, this palace in the underworld that Baal ends up building, right? With the brazen gates uh, that we talked about. So the reason Yahweh is talking to the gates is that he's coming in, right? Baal hears him knocking and now he's coming in, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and as yeah. he's coming in, he's throwing these words back at Baal as a taunt, yeah. right? As mockery. Right. Uh, right. As he comes to raid his his palace, right? Yeah. So when we understand that, you take the psalm as a whole. This psalm is prophesying that there's going to come a day that those even the dead don't belong to the devil. They don't belong to Baal. They don't belong to the Lord of the underworld. They don't belong to Hades or Sheol. They still belong to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and He's going to come down there and get them. Yep. 
He's going to come down there, break in, <laughs> and take them because they still yeah. belong to him. Right? This is what we call the harrowing of hell. Right. And so then, yeah. and then, and 1,200 then. or so years later, it happens. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that you've got the, the, the god of death, uh, the devil, laying claim to these dead people. Um, and God saying, no, actually, they're mine. They're, yeah. they're totally mine. Yeah. And so yeah. this is then a big part of what we're going to be celebrating as we come to the end of Holy Week, especially Holy Saturday, both in the morning and evening. Yeah. We are going to be making present again. We talked about sacred time and space. The day on which this actually happened. When right. Christ, after his death on the cross, uh, his soul uh, descends into Hades and goes there to kick in the gates and get right. those there yeah. who belong to to him and his father and bring them out. Yeah, and it's what's fun is if you look at, you know, iconographic representations of this, both East and West, um, it is not depicted as being like a nice, gentle, peaceful action. You know, the doors are being s not just opened or whatever, but smashed open and often various icons knocked on the ground. And one of my favorite that I saw today the doors are smashed on the ground and there's a demon who's been crushed underneath it, <laughs> you know, with his legs and arms coming out and the other demons are off to the side going, whoa, whoa, what's, <laughs> hey, what's happening? You know, yeah, no. Yeah, right, right. And uh, yeah, so then, then you know, if you're, if you're Orthodox and you've been to Pascha, you've seen this. Now, I, it's my understanding that not every single tradition has the one particular part we're going to mention, but but a lot of people are aware of it, even if they don't have this in their tradition. And if you're not Orthodox people, I'm just going to tell you right now, go to Pascha. You will see exactly what we're about to talk about. Right. So May 1st. Yeah, exactly. May 1st, <laughs> late at night. Yeah. Do, yeah. Make sure they. Yeah. There's some poor people. They show up like in the, they're going to show up in the morning of May 2nd and go. So it's, I understand this is your Easter. I'm like, yeah. um, we're sleeping it off. Yes. Uh, May, <laughs> May 1st, 2021 will become March 26th, 50 or 30 AD. Right. Right. <laughs> so everybody's going to be outside the church. There's going to make a procession around the church. And then there's going to be an entrance made. And in many traditions, what you're going to see is the priest is going to go up to the door of the church and he's going to bang on the door. Now, sometimes he does it with his fist. Sometimes he does it with a hand cross. I have broken a couple of hand crosses. Uh, and he says, lift up your gates, O ye princes, be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall enter in. And there's a voice from inside that says, who is this king of glory? Or as a good friend of mine once said about 20 years ago, who is this cling of glory? which I have never let him to live down. I say to him, I text it to him every single year. Uh, <laughs> who is this king of glory? Now, see, I'm going to mess up and say it wrong. Uh, and then the priest says, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in war. And this is done three times. And then at the very end, the priest then says, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Or Yahweh Sabaoth, as it says right there in, in my bad version of Hebrew. He is the king of glory. And then the doors are opened. So what you get then is this liturgical, it's not a reenactment. Remember what we said about ritual participation a zillion times in the show. That moment, that place, it becomes the invasion of Hades, truly. And you are there. This is, this is the Son and Word of God, the Lord of hosts himself, the Lord of spirits invading hell. And because he's going in there to release those who are held captive by the power of death and the devil. And so this, this understanding was preserved in the liturgical tradition of the Orthodox Church, even though probably a lot of you out there, this is the first time you've ever heard any of this stuff from the bail cycle. Uh, it was new to me just a few years ago. But this understanding was preserved in liturgical practice that these lines from this psalm are about the invasion of the realm of death by the Son of God himself to come and rescue the dead. 
And if, if that doesn't just blow you away, I don't know what's, well, there's a lot more to come. <laughs> Actually, yeah. and, there's and, more to come. And to put, I mean, to put a fine point on that, if you'd asked any Orthodox person, who's, who's the voice coming from it, they would tell you, oh, that's the devil. That's the devil. And, and right? what is this? Well, this is Christ getting down the doors and we're quoting this psalm, right? So that, that interpretation, that context for this, this passage of scripture, for Psalm 24 slash 23, the context for that, the original ancient context for that, even though Ugarit was buried in the dirt for 3,000 years, right? right? That context was preserved in the Orthodox Church through its worship. And so this is what we're talking about, not to go all the way down this rabbit trail, but this is an exhibit A of what we're talking about in the Orthodox Church when we talk about tradition. Tradition right. isn't like some additional information that's not in the Bible that we added to the Bible. It's not uh, just sort of folk customs that accumulated along the, his, the, the route of history. When right. we talk about holy tradition, we're talking about the way in which the worship, the practice, the, the uh, theology, all of this of the Orthodox Church has preserved the original context of the scriptures, the original context of the belief of the apostles and of the prophets and the authors of scripture and of generations past. And this is exhibit A of it. Yeah. Because uh, about the only place you could get that original context until we dug up Ugarit was the Orthodox Church. And most people who encountered it in the Orthodox Church until we uncovered Ugarit just thought, well, that's a weird allegorical interpretation or something. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. So that's the first half of the show. We've got two more halves to go. And, um, well, let's have a break and uh, let's hear from the voice of Steve. Let's go to break. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Doxamut Online. Tolkien, Enchantment, and the Christian Life. An ancient faith event. For the Christian, the enchanted or sacramental worldview is critical to a wholesome, full life in Christ. The work of fantasy author J.R.R. Tolkien provides a shaping for the imagination and soul that contributes to this vision. Join the hosts of Ancient Faith Radio's Amansul podcast in this special online event that explores how this shaping happens in partnership with the St. Basil Center for Orthodox Thought and Culture. The webinar will take place on Friday, May 7th and Saturday, May 8th, and speakers include Dr. Cyril Gary Jenkins, Father Andrew Stephen Damick, and Richard Rowland. The cost is $30, and registration will close on Wednesday, May 5th at noon Eastern. To secure your spot, please visit store.ancientfaith.com slash doximute. That's store.ancientfaith.com slash doximute. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, Call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome back. This is the second half of the show, and it's where we begin to take your calls. Just like the voice of Steve just said, you can reach us at 855-AF-RADIO or 855-237-2346. And uh, it looks like we actually have a couple calls coming in here. Um, oh, actually, the person I was going to take just disappeared off the call call board. All right, well, try to call back, uh, and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So, All right, so just to recap, we were just talking about Psalm 24 in the first half and about how it is basically a whole bunch of smack talk against Baal worship because, you know, ancient Israel was surrounded by Baal worshipers, and occasionally Baal worship even invaded 
the the life of the people of Israel. Um, some of them began to worship Baal, and so Baal was definitely a going concern um, in that that time and place. Uh, so, uh, all right, well, uh, let's go ahead and take a call. So it looks like we have Eugene calling, and if I remember correctly, Eugene, you're somewhere in the upper Midwest, isn't that right? Yeah, sure, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. You ready to take your uh, your trip to to Ugarit? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so Eugene, uh, what what <laughs> what is it you've got for us tonight, Eugene? Well, first I just got to say that I'm very glad to finally be calling into the Amon Sua live call-in program. Uh huh. Sure. <laughs> Let's cut this guy off right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> is this the token Tolkien call? Yes, this is the guy who says that they're the same podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, you've yes. already referenced it a couple of times in this episode. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, you know, sometimes when you're talking to Protestants about the herring of Hades, um, they will say that it's not anywhere in the Bible, and you guys have already addressed this a little bit, but... Um, I think if you're, and I know there's a couple references throughout the New Testament, but I think if you're taking, uh, if you take the the idea that you guys have been talking about, about spiritual geography, I think just the fact that Christ was buried in the ground is a biblical testimony to him entering into Hades. If, if ding, Hades ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, notice when people go underground, that means something. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So so is 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 that your comment or do you have a question in addition to that? I was just asking if that was correct. <laughs> but I do have You are correct. <laughs> if I can ask another question, but if, if not, that's okay. No, no, go ahead, throw it out. You're on the line. You might as well. This is your chance. All right. All right. So I was explaining to someone uh in an arch in the that I know who's Orthodox, uh about the uh, the ritual that you guys were just talking about, the knocking on the doors of the church and reading the oh, psalm. Yeah. And he hadn't heard about it before, but he seemed to have a problem with the idea that the church becomes Hades. And mm. uh, I, it's kind of been a quite, I mean, it's come up in my mind too, but I, uh, I, I'll just uh, listen to your guys' input on that. Hmm. Well, what do you have to say about that, Father Stephen? Well, the the church isn't becoming Hades, <laughs> right? <laughs> what you have is what you have is the event being collapsed because there's really two parts, and the other part is also depicted in iconography, though that iconography is less common. So the 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 common iconography of of the resurrection, you have Christ's invasion of Hades. He's grabbing Adam and Eve, and and you've got the Old Testament saints there and Saint John the Forerunner. Um, <laughs> The other half of that is Christ then leading them into paradise, right? Mm -hmm. And that iconography, usually you'll see like this big crew of people uh, behind Christ walking into like a, a garden through a door. And uh, Abraham will be hanging out there with a bunch of little kids uh, representing uh, people who died as children. And uh, there's a guy holding a cross. That's St. Dismas, the wise thief. Those are the people who are already in paradise. Um, and then Christ is leading sort of everybody else <laughs> right into there. And so when we do that ritual uh, on, you notice we, we don't do that on Saturday morning. We do it on Saturday evening uh, because we're, we're sort of collapsing it into the second part of that event. Yeah. So, Although, let me add this though, Father. Yeah. There actually are some places I understand, like in Greece, where they do that the night before. Okay. Uh, so there so is a little bit of variation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of variation at that point. Yeah, they're not collapsing it. They're doing it as the entrance into Hades, whereas we're collapsing the event when we do it on Saturday night. Um, and so the church right you're outside and you're in the darkness and then the church has been hopefully if the guy you told to do it does his job that year uh <laughs> right. is completely illumined right yeah <laughs> so so you're coming from the darkness into the light so 
the part of coming into the church is the second part of that event, the coming into paradise. Um, and so when you make the procession, uh, the procession in the darkness with just the small light of the candle is the waiting in Hades of, of the departed saints, right? Which then culminates in Christ's rescue of them and they're entering into paradise, which is sort of collapsed there at the end. Yeah. So does that answer your question, Eugene? Yes, it does. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for calling. We are happy to hear from you. All thank joking you aside. <laughs> Ninety yeah. percent of joking aside, yeah, I'm yeah, still ten yeah. percent most, joking. Most joking aside, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so we talked Psalm twenty four last time. We talked about the invasion of Hades by Christ and the smack talk against Baal. Uh, so let's move into another another group of of gods that uh, we're gonna. <laughs> throw some more smack down on yeah. you know people sometimes are like you know how, how can you be so sarcastic like that is that biblical i'm like yes uh you know they got the prophet elias who's the patron saint of sarcasm yeah so um <laughs> yes there is a lot of sarcasm christ is actually sarcastic very sarcastic on several occasions it gets yeah. kind of neutered in the english translation yeah. because yeah. you know that but yeah. That'll have to wait for another episode. Yes. Um, okay. So, all right. So let's let's head on over to Egypt. Right. Let's been, go. Let's go. We, put the smack down on those guys. We're at this point. We're probably bailed out. So uh, boom. We'll <laughs> we'll uh, we're going to move on now to the Egyptians and specifically to the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15. Okay. Uh, this is the biblical Song of the Sea, not immigrant song or a sea shanty, uh, which I guess are. <laughs> In with the Hepcats these days, um, but uh, this or pirate rap that was in about fifteen years ago. There was a trend. Anyway, um, I had just blocked that out, and now you're <laughs> opening up old wounds. Yes, uh, you're just picturing you're picturing Jamie Bennett with an eye patch now. I know you are. I um, am. So, hey, Jamie. <laughs> so, uh, Exodus 15 uh, contains right. the Song of the Sea, which is it, the reason it's called the Song of the Sea is that this is the song which uh, we're told uh, the children of Israel, led by uh, Miriam, uh, Moses' sister, uh, sing after uh, Israel has passed through, uh, we'll say for now, the Red Sea. <laughs> right. Yes. Just put um, a pin in, just put a yeah. pin in that name. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then and then they sing this this uh, song of uh, victory, and uh, this is uh, while recorded in Exodus 15. This is one of the oldest. This is one of the two oldest pieces of anything that are in the scriptures. Yeah, uh, it's kind of almost in another language, isn't it? Yes, it's in a kind of Paleo Hebrew, so it's even hard to translate. Um, the other yeah. ve very, very old one is Deuteronomy 32. Uh, and we've talked about Deuteronomy 32 a little bit before. We're going to talk about it some more in a little bit. But um, those are the first two odes of the canon. They're the first two biblical odes right. uh, in the Orthodox Church. And they are also these sort of ancient. And when I say that, because I know we're going to get all the angry Moses wrote the Torah people. Uh, showing up at my house with pitchforks and torches. Um, <laughs> right. So, so I'm not saying Moses didn't write the Torah, yeah. right? but, uh, what Moses wrote, uh, first of all, wouldn't have been on paper. Uh, it would have yeah. been on tablets. It wouldn't have been in Hebrew because the language didn't exist. There wasn't. Um, Right. It would it would have looked a lot more like Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32, frankly, than the rest of the Torah. Right. So um, it's better to talk about the Mosaic origin of the Torah or Pentateuch than the Mosaic authorship. Authorship. Because yeah. what we have is not exactly what Moses would have written down. Right. Because he didn't speak that language. Right. There wasn't that alphabet, you know, like right. this has been handed down through some hands. Right. Before it's been it translated, got... translated into Greek. If you're an Orthodox Christian, 
right? Right. We give just as much, at least just as much authority to the Greek, which was a language that didn't exist when Moses lived, right? Um, as, as we do to any other version. Uh, so this shouldn't be a big problem for people. But uh, and there are places where this is made plain, where in the text of the, the Torah or Pentateuch, you know, it'll say, he went to this city, which used to be called this other name, right? Well, that had to be written by somebody later, right? The name's yeah. been updated for a later right. audience. Right? And then and then the big teller, you know, is is when you get to the, the funeral of Moses. Right, where Moses dies, yeah. And yeah. it says his body has not been found until this very day. Right, which, I mean, I guess you could say, well, he was writing this prophetically, you know. But, but then that makes no sense to say his body had not been found to this very day if he hadn't which died yet when you wrote day it. was that? Yeah, right. 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 <laughs> it was the day before he died. Um, right. So <laughs> right. don't get too hung up on that. Yes, the Torah, the Pentateuch, as we have it, comes down to us from Moses, right? But, right. but these two pieces of the text, the one we're going to focus on now, uh, Exodus 15, uh, the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15, has come down to us with little to no editing, right? Mm. That's what we mean by it's the oldest part. It hasn't right. been edited. The language hasn't been updated. The vocabulary hasn't been updated. So much so that it's very difficult to read and translate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And contains words from other Semitic languages and stuff, right? So um, that's all we mean by that. Right. Uh, Right. So, and, and, you know, if you happen to be listening to this in the recording, uh, then I just suggest that you, because we're not going to read the whole thing to you, but I just suggest you pause and then go read Exodus chapter 15 and then come back. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> Good to have you back. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so, uh, now, uh, the other, the other thing that's going to, uh, have people throwing things at me, um, <laughs> As we court controversy, um, part of the problem in terms of uh, interpreting this text and understanding this text is that in our contemporary world, almost all of the literature and time and attention that's devoted to this text is devoted to historical concerns, right? Meaning, yeah. did the Exodus happen? Was right. there really a Moses? What year did it happen? Who was the Pharaoh? Where right. did this, it happen? What yeah. body of water did they cross? This yeah. is this is the stuff that is what history is now. Like this is what the way history works now. It's about, you know, trying to figure out what is in text, is trying to compare against archaeology. And and I mean, listen, we're not saying that those are bad things to work on, right? I mean, we talk about archaeology, we talk, you know, like we're 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 looking at those details in this very show. Yeah. But it's not really what's actually important, and it's not really what's being represented in the texts. Right. So, some of my best friends are PhDs in history, so we're not <laughs> we're not out to get you. Um, but um, but we have to realize that what we call history came into existence in the 19th century in Germany. Yeah. It did not exist as a discipline before that. There was something they called history, but it's not what we call history. Right. Um, what we right. call history, the, the Germans in the 19th century, beginning at the beginning of the 19th century, decided that history should be approached as Wissenschaft, meaning it should be approached as a science. Yeah, a kind of forensic, right. you know, uh, uh, a, uh, dissection. <laughs> you right. Know. It's, a, it's a positivist. If you read anything from the 19th century, this positivist approach is everywhere. Like you read Hodges... Systematic theology from Princeton, who was a Presbyterian, wrote a systematic theology. Like his whole introduction is about how theology is a science. And if you start with the right principles derived from scripture and follow logical inference, you know, the, the, the findings of systematic theology are just as certain as the findings of physics or chemistry, right? And you're kind of rolling your eyes, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was the 19th century, especially 19th century Germans, right? Yeah, they say, right. Right. We can approach this, we can know the essence of things. We can know the essence of events through the scientific method, right? So you get people like Hegel and Feuerbach and Marx who say, hey, 
We could discover the laws that work themselves out in history the same way the scientists are discovering the laws of physics or the laws of nature, right? Uh, that, that history works the same way, right? There's right. rules and principles right. that we can scientifically arrive at, right. and that's right. how we're going to interpret history. Right. There's this sort of attempt to have a totally, you know, the word would be objective, quote unquote. But really what that means is a kind of perspectiveless take. <laughs> That's right. just a contradiction of terms. But the idea is like, well, no, this is what really happened. It doesn't matter. No, no one's opinion about it or experience of it is what we're discussing. We're talking about what really happened. Right. The you know? essence, the essence of the event. And to quote Thomas Nagel of what is it like to be a bat fame? Uh, there is no view from nowhere. Right. There is right. no there is no viewpoint that is no place. <laughs> right. right. Every I mean, is somewhere. Like this is one of the points that, for instance, that our our good friend Jonathan Pajot makes when he in like he has an article, which I recommend you check it out, called "Most of the Time the Earth is Flat," and by that he does not mean that he thinks that the Earth is a flat disk. Sorry, flat earthers. Uh, what he means is that your experience of it is that it is flat and that you experience that the sun rises. But I mean, we've said some of this kind of stuff before, but so this is, but this is important for us to review it just a little bit because of what we're about to talk about. Right. You and know, we, that, that, I was just gonna say, we set up for this in the last couple episodes. Yes, right? exactly. There exactly. is an objective historical event. We're not in any way denying that right. these things really happen. Yeah. We're not solipsists. But, we don't have access to the essences of things, including historical events. Yeah. What we have are the record of human experience, of humans who experience those events. And there's an interaction between their human consciousness and the event. And the record we have is the interplay of those two things. Right. And so and if the person is telling the truth about their experience, then their account is true. It right. doesn't matter if we have another person talking about the same event and those things don't match up perfectly. Right. They right. could both be true. They could both be telling the truth if they're describing their experience accurately. And so right. this and, is, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, right. and that's what the Bible is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 like, I mean, a, a lot of you have probably heard this before, this argument. Um, you know, talking about, for instance, the four Gospels. Okay, so if you read the four Gospels, you will notice that there are some details that don't quite seem to exactly reconcile with each other. Which right? clearly and, means they're totally made up, totally fact. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Whereas <laughs> what 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 St. John Chrysostom actually says about, this is what was new to me. I didn't know that he made this argument. I was so delighted to discover that he had. He basically says, look, if there's a conspiracy and you know you have a group of people that all give the exact same testimony in court and it's exactly the same you can tell that that is a conspiracy that that they're lying together in the same way but when you've got these different perspectives that don't all quite line up of this of uh, various people who witness the same thing and experience the same thing that actually is an authenticator for the the truth of what actually happened Right. And, and, and that is just a beautiful way of talking, of, of describing the problem that we're addressing right now, because, you know, this sort of scientific method approach to history and so and so forth would suggest that the only true account would always perfectly line up. Like you said, that they sort of these laws of history that kind of play out. But the truth is, you know, that that's actually exactly wrong. <laughs> That's exactly wrong. That if everything lines up, that's probably an indication that a whole bunch of people all, are all telling the same lie. You know, it, it just would never be that way. You right. know, and especially if it's like a big traumatic or dramatic or violent event or something like that. You're going to get very different perspectives as to what occurred. Yeah. And l let me not very humbly suggest um, that this is the orthodox answer to the great impasse of Old Testament studies. Hmm. The 19th century ruined Old Testament studies because with this new positivist definition of history and understanding of history, what you got was very quickly our German liberal friends who had come up with this idea of history start applying it to the Old Testament. And they say, well, okay, we have these written documents and yes, those are evidence. 
But those are evidence from one perspective. Therefore, they aren't the essence of the events. They aren't the reality of the events. And so we're going to now construct our laws of history, and we're going to go and we're going to do archaeology, and we're going to gather all the other evidence we can find, documents from surrounding cultures, and we're going to reconstruct what actually happened. And if that conflicts with what the Bible says, then we just say, well, the Bible's got it wrong, right? Or the Bible's biased, or the Bible doesn't have the truth. So that's their approach. And so to this day, if you go to a biblical studies conference, you'll have people who go to the book of Joshua and say, well, look, this is just Israelite propaganda. Uh, none of this happened. And we're going to reconstruct what actually happened. And since we accept a base, the Marxist laws of history, that all of history up until the 19th century was the history of class struggle, uh, that that's what's going on here and there was really a canaanite peasant revolt led by some escaped egyptian slaves that's what really happened and then that was mythologized by the later israelites into the book of joshua that's to this day that's a very common view of what what's going on with joshua in academia right now right in reaction to that your conservative old testament folks mostly conservative protestants uh reacted to the exact opposite extreme. They didn't reject that definition of history. They accepted that definition of history. They just said, no, what the Bible records is the literal, actual essence of the historical events with no bias and no perspective whatsoever. Right. right? So it happened exactly as it says. Right, which is right? why then you get like, okay, so we're actually about to start talking about the crossing of the Red Sea, where you then get people coming up with theories about strong winds and right. you know all of this kind of stuff to try to sort of figure out the physics of how this worked right and so when they do archaeology you've got the bible king james bible in one hand and a spade in the other hand and you're out there trying to prove i'm going to prove that this is literally exactly true well if it's right? the king james bible i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is the impasse that Old, Stud Old Testament studies has been in for 150 years. And I think there's a very orthodox way right through it, which yeah. is to understand that we don't know the essences of events and we can't know them. Yeah. Especially events of the distant past. I mean, Aristotle could have told you this too, but um, <laughs> we know how those events, events appeared to the people who experienced them. Right. That's what we have access to. And we have particular accounts of those experiences, which are authoritative and which have been handed down to us. Right. And that especially as Orthodox Christians, we believe that the Holy Spirit had something to do with that. Right. And we right. seek to share the experience of the people who experience God directly. Yeah. In these events, not yeah. to get at some reality that lies behind the experience. Right. Now, that might seem like a long sort of rabbit trail or whatever go down. <laughs> but it's, well, number one, this is actually one of our kind of over, overarching themes for this whole podcast, right? But in particular for tonight, since we're about to start talking about the crossing of the Red Sea, it's really important um, so that you know that what we're about to talk about is the experience of the people who were there and how they recorded it and how that was then handed on within the context of the people of God as guided by the Holy Spirit, God himself. That's what we're talking about. So, okay, well, let's, should we talk about why Red Sea is not the name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the Red Sea, everybody. Oh, it is the Red Sea, but it's not the Red Sea. Well, it sort of is the Red Sea, yeah. Yeah. So, um, it was the Greeks who started calling it the Red Sea. We'll start yeah. there, right? Yeah. So. So uh, the name Red Sea would have meant nothing to Moses or the Israelites or the Egyptians. Um, that's not what they called it. That's what the Greeks called it. And so when uh, the Septuagint uh, gets translated, which is the Torah in Greek, uh, gets translated, they said, what body of water is this? Oh, that's the Red Sea. So they yeah. translated it as Red Sea. Uh, right. That gets into English Bibles. Because, as we were talking about earlier, the King James translators, for example, were kind of scratching their head at the Hebrew, saying, what body of water is this? They looked at the Greek, they looked at the Latin, they said, oh, the Red Sea, we know where that is, right? <laughs> so they carried that over into English. Um, so um, 
In terms of colors, we'll do a callback. Uh, there we go. To our friend the mantis shrimp. Um, the the Egyptians uh, not only didn't refer to it as the Red Sea, but they referred to uh, all big bodies of water as the Great Green. That's what the Egyptian literally means. The Great yeah. Green. Because they didn't see blue. They uh, couldn't see blue. There's our callback. <laughs> Um, but so they, they referred to the Mediterranean as the great green to the north or the great green of the north. Right. Cause they're in Egypt and they referred to what the Greeks called, uh, the, uh, red sea as the great green of the east, right? which I feel like that, that should be, you know, a 1950s superhero exclamation, great green of the east back yeah. then, you know, yeah. Like that. Oh yeah. Everybody had one. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Great Caesar's <laughs> ghost. Was a good one. Yes, indeed. Did Caesar's ghost just appear to newspaper <laughs> editors at random? Like, how does that work? Um, but that's another uh, episode. Yeah. <laughs> great, great of the east. Yeah, was Caesar a nephilim? Yeah. Is that what's going on? Anyway, oh, um, so um, now what, what's actually there in the Hebrew is Yam Suf, uh, okay. which. It, you know, this is this is one of those tidbits that people pick up off of Bible documentaries, right? Um, there's a few tidbits that people get, uh, and then sometimes, depending on what they do with them, cause people great consternation. Like they hear that Satan is a title, not a name, or something, and they go and start bothering people on Twitter. Um, but uh, in this case, it's it's Yom Suf means Sea of Reeds is what you'll usually hear, uh, which is not wrong, as we're about to talk about. Um, right, but although it does mean sea of reeds, suf can mean reeds. Uh, the earlier meaning of the word suf, if you go back further into the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, suf meant the end or the extremity or the border yeah. or the, the border, edge, the like edge, the edge, um, sort of the extreme part. And so, in that context, it would have meant something like. Uh, the uh, the sea at the end, the end of the the end sea or the border sea, yeah, um, and that makes sense for that same rough body of water, uh, okay. because it's at the eastern border, right of Egypt, right? right. It's sort of marked off uh, the eastern border, and uh, to get even more specific about the body of water. Uh, thanks to the Google uh, and uh, the Google Earths, uh, we've now seen from satellite imagery that in ancient times, there were a series of locks connected to the, what we now call the Red Sea. Yeah, right. To, to control, you know, the flow of water, which super important, you know, if, if, if uh, flooding is, imp is a key part of your agriculture, which... In Egypt, in the ancient world, it definitely was. Uh, so, yeah, right. So it's this border water that's got a series of locks. Right, yeah. this, this sea of the end. And so anybody exiting Egypt is going to ha and heading east is going to have to cross through these this system of locks, right, and right. in order to get out. Right. Um, they're going to have to move through them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So... so yeah, I was going to say, so what's interesting then is, you you know, most people, when they think about the crossing of the Red Sea, they see one of two images in their head. One of them has Charlton Heston. Uh, the other one is probably the animated film uh, <laughs> about Moses. Um, and it, it's, you know, uh, the people of Israel all running away from Pharaoh and his, his soldiers so that they don't get killed. Uh, and they, they cross... They cross it, and then it comes in on Pharaoh and his soldiers, and they all die. And yet, weirdly then, Exodus 15, the Song of the Sea, depicts the whole thing as being a battle. So what's right. going on there? What's that all about? <laughs> right. Wait, right. it isn't a battle? I thought it was a, 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 you know, a, a last desperate escape, you know, that right. they got away just in time. They didn't actually and, fight the Egyptians. And, and this, is, this is part of the fallout, I think, of that... Uh, that whole impasse and debate we were talking about, right, is that it becomes about, well, did this miracle happen? Right. 
right? This is this miraculous, absurd thing that we modern science people can't believe, right? And then, uh, you know, uh, other people react and say, no, we must believe that this literally happened exactly like this, uh, this miracle. Um, but yeah, that's not how the Song of the Sea sees it. It's not just like, wow, God did this cool thing with the water and there was a whale swimming around inside the water wall and all that <laughs> uh, right which i mean that's cool i mean i love those you know it, it's 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 pretty neat you know cecil b demille and whatever but yeah uh yeah. that's not the focus of the song of the sea the song of the sea is uh yahweh just laid the smack down <laughs> right, right on on pharaoh and his army and and at all right right because right because and god God, you know, telegraphed this move. Uh, at the beginning of the whole incident, God says, I am going, I am now judging the gods of Egypt. Right. That's at the path. That's what he says he's doing at the Passover, which is what leads to the exodus. Right. That's now I will when the, the throwdown happens. This is what I'm about to do. <laughs> and yeah. so this is, as it's presented in the song of the sea, this is sort of the crossing of the sea is the last battle of that war. Right. Uh, with the God of Egypt. And that's why right at the beginning, uh, in verse three, it says, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name, uh, which would make a great book title. Huh. But <laughs> God we'll is a man of war. Out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's but, a nice book title. Uh, it, interestingly, you know, now people find that kind of controversial because we don't like war. Uh, that was actually controversial in the ancient world because of the man part. Oh, People are like, yeah. wait, Yahweh's a man? W what? Right? Well, um, yes. Stay tuned for a later episode on the second <laughs> right. person of the Trinity. Um, yeah, right, right, exactly. So, actually, um, yes. Right, and so this is this is this sort of uh, climactic battle, and you see that in uh, some of the other language used. Also, uh, there are repeated references to Yahweh's right hand and strong arm. Yeah, over and over, it's it's there. Yeah, Being, like verse six: the right hand of Lord has become glorious in power. Thy right hand of Lord hath dashed in pieces the enemy. By the way, that's the verse that the priest says as he puts on his right uh, cuff when he's getting his vestments on. How about yeah. that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So this this language is right out there, and you know. It's easy to just kind of say, oh, that's that's an allegorical thing, right? Like, oh, you, you know, most people are right-handed, so that's your strong arm, right? So it's like, yeah, he, 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 he slugged them. Um, but this actually has a very specific Egyptian reference. Yeah, yeah, we're not just making, we're not just commenting, you know, using language like we used in, in the, the body episodes, everybody. You know, the right hand of the Lord is his strength. That is true. But that's not all that's going on here, because once again, we're talking about divine smack talk against right. de demonic gods. Right. So, so, yeah. So what's what's the right hand and strong arm stuff? The, all about? The, the god of war in this period of Egyptian history is the god Montu. Um, and Montu was seen as sort of an aspect of Ray, the sun god, the, the most high god of the Egyptian. Uh, right. The Egyptian, uh, what we now, would now call a pantheon, but of the Egyptian gods, he was the one who was the of their council of gods. He was the Most High God, and as an aspect of Ray, Montu was particularly depicted as Ray's right arm. Hmm. Uh, he's Ray's right arm, and he's the war god, <laughs> right? <laughs> their god of war, right? It's and strength. this became yeah. a title because in this period. Uh, I mentioned to you when we were when we were talking about uh, about this episode that I have like a three hundred page book on the naming conventions of the pharaohs uh, <laughs> throughout the various periods of Egyptian history. I bet During it this... is a real page turner. Oh, it is. <laughs> oh uh, yeah. And one of them during this period was <laughs> every pharaoh had what was called his Horus name because. The pharaoh was seen to be a, an in sort of incarnation or aspect of Horus, the son of yeah. Ray. Um, and so uh, one of the pharaoh's titles was Horus of the Strong Arm. How about that? <laughs> uh, so this, this is an important time. This is a way that the Egyptians expressed their power in war, their might in battle, the way the pharaoh himself expressed his might in battle. And so... We have, in response, Yahweh saying, oh, yeah, I just trashed Pharaoh and his armies, the Egyptian gods, with my right arm. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, right. even centuries later, the prophet right. Ezekiel is still rubbing this in. Oh, yeah, right, right. I love this. So <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 21. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. So it's still the smack talk continues. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. And notice, notice, right? The right arm is broken, can't hold a sword, can't make war. Yeah. Right? He's, this he's is about weak. war. Right. right and and about defeat and uh we also have this in uh referred to in uh the apolitician uh of the resurrection in tone three right right which uh says that the lord has done a mighty act with his own oh. arm <laughs> right? and that yeah. own there is again this is that like pointing out the name it's his arm that's mighty in battle, yeah so not anybody else's the smack talk continues even yes. now to the very present day <laughs> unto this right. very day yes yes um, until this very day yes <laughs> right yeah so, and 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 what is and and just you know since this is our harrowing of hell episode what is the the act that the lord has done with his his own right his own arm destroying death that's right destroying death yeah so right right so, okay it's, yeah. But now going a bit further, <laughs> right? And uh, this is about the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea, right? Yamsu. Because we've set up the idea of sacred geography, right? So we've talked about, yes, there's this border sea, right? There's this Yamsu, this border sea that they have to cross. But we've also talked about how places, these material places, become in time and space. Uh, spiritual places, spiritual geography. And there is a spiritual place called the Sea of Reeds, uh, called the, uh, the Yam Suf. Uh, this is Mkeu in uh, Egyptian. And yes, that first syllable is Mke, like Mr. Mackey. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the, uh, the uh, and this is, oh, no, not, not Mke, sorry, I got ahead of myself. So the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea is the sort of Egyptian equivalent in the Middle Kingdom. Um, you see this in like the pyramid texts uh, of the River Styx. It's the body of water you have to cross after right. death to get right. to the place of your abode, right? Right. And, and and all of you symbolic world people will recognize when you see some kind of border with water on it, <laughs> you should be thinking about entering into a realm of chaos and death. Like it's just, that's, that's you know, the margin, right? The margin, right. right, right. And so if, if you can get past this this watery body, the Sea of Reeds, uh, then you'll get to the other side and you'll have this shadowy existence in the presence of the Egyptian gods. Yeah, right? just like in Greek mythology. And, and so the, period tech, the pyramid texts are burial texts with spells and invocations and that kind of thing to help get the spirits of the gods to guide the Ka, the soul of the departed person through the sea of reeds to the other side safely. Right. If you don't, this is where I got ahead of myself. If you don't make it, you become one of the Mkeu. Uh, the Mkeu are the drowned ones is what that mm. literally means. These are people who get tangled in the reeds and get pulled down into the sea of reeds and sort of lose their identity, right? And become the drowned ones. They're the damned for Egyptians. That's what you don't want to happen to you. Sort of, could they be called the dead marshes? Just putting that out. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you trying to prove that guy right? Why? <laughs> um, but I mean, it's the same thing. But I mean, okay, well, like, you know, if you don't mind, if I go there for a second, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's the same thing. So you've got Frodo and Sam and Gollum crossing over this marshy area and there's what do you know there's dead people down there in the water and what's on the other side of it mordor the place of death the dark the, the land that's governed by essentially the local satan so i mean i mean yeah th obviously this is not the tolkien podcast but i mean tolkien is working in these exact same images in there he's he's he knows this stuff so yeah i mean you know e eugene is wrong but he's not totally wrong <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's, it, it, there's, there's, there is definitely, there are definitely touchstones between these, these 
images, right? right? You know, that that there is this sense that human beings have that there's a watery thing that you cross over and on the other side is the realm of death and there's a big, big bad death god over there. Like that's something that kind of mankind has always thought in one right. way or another. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so the, the whole promise of Egyptian religion what they're working towards is they serve their gods, right? And, and do these rituals and everything is this idea that perhaps, you know, and especially the Pharaoh has the best shot at it of getting across the sea of reeds to this, this, this shadowy existence safely. And lo and behold, look what the song of the sea points out happened. Yeah. Pharaoh and his wait, soldiers wait. <laughs> are the drowned ones. The drowned ones. But wait, I thought that all religions were just trying to get everybody to heaven. Isn't that what they're really all about? Aren't they the same? No. 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 Okay. So, <laughs> so the drowned ones are Pharaoh and his, his armies. Yeah. And the ones who were guided through to the other side were guided through safely to the other side to go and dwell with their God uh, in the promised land by, by Yahweh. Yahweh's right. the one who did that. Right. And it's not, you know, and, and, and it, it's important to note here that they don't like take the long way around they don't hop over they don't tunnel underneath <laughs> they go through the realm of death in order to get to the other side right they go through it that's really important for this right so they so when we talk about pasca which means passover yep and yep. passing from death to life right that's not an allegorical thing what they're telling us in the Song of the Sea is that the people who were there who experienced this the first time had the experience of passing through death, passing through the realm of death and being brought through safely to the other side to new life by Yahweh, yeah. the God of Israel. Yeah. And that's the experience we're sharing in when we celebrate Passover, when we celebrate Pascha. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so this stuff then... Again, we're going to connect this directly to liturgical stuff that Orthodox Christians are experiencing in the next week. Uh, or if we do have at least one listener, I think, in Finland who experienced it a few weeks ago. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> next week. Next week. Okay. So so there is a canon <clears throat> that is the canon of, uh, of Holy Saturday. So it, it's first sung on Holy Friday night during that matin service, which is what? The funeral of Christ, essentially. Um, but then that same canon actually gets repeated during the midnight office at the Paschal services. So it's, it's, it gets reused. And in the sixth ode, right, which always, uh, which, which uh, I shouldn't say always. Well, yeah, it always thematically connects in one way or another with, um, with Jonah. So, right, so often the sixth ode has references to going underwater and this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and experiencing death. Um, in that sixth ode, you've got this line. The children of those who were saved hid underground the God who made the persecuting giant of old to disappear in the waves of the sea. Right? So that means that the fathers who wrote these hymns deliberately picked this image of passing through the Sea of Reeds uh, and and it describes Pharaoh as a persecuting giant of old, comes right out and calls him a giant, and made him disappear in the waves of the sea. So this, this image that we were just talking about now is specifically appointed in our liturgical hymns to be appropriate for the events that happen with Holy Saturday and with Pascha itself, because Pascha is Passover, it's the Christian Passover, these things are all connected. It's right there. And what do you know? There's a giant <laughs> right there in the midst of it, you know, who is this demonized king, Pharaoh, right? right. Um, down, down in the part horse, down part in the human. underground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you know, this is this is how this is why St. Paul sees this connection between the crossing of the Red Sea and baptism, because he understands right. Christian baptism as dying and rising with Christ, passing right. from death to life in the waters, 
which is exactly what Exodus is talking about. There's no allegory yes. here. That's what right. it's talking about. And so that's why we read slash chant, depending on the parts, <laughs> right? the story of the crossing of the sea and the song of the sea at the baptismal liturgy on Saturday morning, when you do the ba whole baptismal liturgy with the 15 Old Testament readings, um, which I always try to schedule at least a cr chrismation so that we can do that, the longer version, um, on, on uh, Holy Saturday. And this, again, this is, again, part of that, the darkness and light imagery we were talking about earlier at the rush service on, on Pascha night. Uh, and th this whole idea of, again, sharing that experience of being brought through death into life on the other side. Yeah, they're not avoiding death. They're passing through death to life. It's, it's resurrectional. That's what's going on here. So... All right, well, that is the second half of our show, but it, since it's the Lord of Spirits, there's a, there's a third half. Um, so in our first half, we talked about the invasion of Hades and the smack talk against Baal. The second half, we talked about Passover, going through the Sea of Reeds, passing through death to life. What's gonna happen in the third half? We'll be right back after this. Here's the voice of Steve. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Ancient Faith Publishing presents I Live Again, a memoir of Ileana. Princess of Romania and Archduchess of Austria, who in later life became Mother Alexandra, founder of the Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration in Pennsylvania, who wrote this memoir shortly after relocating to the U.S. in the 1950s. It tells the story of a life full of suffering, tragedy, and exile, but all is suffused with the author's deep faith, hope, love, and even joy. This reprint includes additional material collected by the nuns of her monastery that sets the memoir in the context of Mother Alexandra's later life. To find this book and others like it, you can go to store.ancientfaith.com. Again, that is store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-237. 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. Welcome back. It's the third half of our Holy Week and Pascha Spectacular, the harrowing of hell here on the Lord of Spirits. Um, wow. So uh, that's a lot we just went through, but we've got even more. But before we get to that, I actually want to um, mention something that I know that a lot of you have been waiting on um, very anxiously and demanding pre-orders and wanting to even see if you could possibly buy the bibliography. Yes, people are asking to buy the bibliography, Father Stephen, uh, <laughs> of Father Stephen's book that's coming out in just about, God willing, about a week and a half. It's supposed to come out during Bright Week. Uh, we can't give you a precise date, but it is on track to release when it's intended. Uh, it's called The Religion of the Apostles. It's about 300 pages long. Is that right, Father? Give or take. Give or take. Give or take, yeah. Um, and, and it is not Lord of Spirits in print. Okay, that's not what the book is. But if you like this podcast, you will love the book. I know that sounds very cheesy. But it's true because a lot of the things that we talk about in the show, Father Stephen has written in the book um, in a much more systematic kind of way. But there's also a whole lot more in there as well. Um, and there is indeed a bibliography. This is probably the question we get every single day. You know, can you give me some suggestion for further reading? Well, it's going to now be there in the back of the book. And the book is indexed. It's fully indexed. Uh, that's a really important thing for a book like this. So uh, God willing, it's going to come out, as I said, during Bright Week. And I hope everybody will order a copy, uh, order 10 copies. We have a um, sort of competition going on in the Laura Spirits Facebook discussion group trying attempting to to try to outbuy the supply we encourage you to do that if you possibly can but you know we will only just order up a reprint so 
uh, you will not defeat us at Ancient Faith Publishing. But, uh, but it is it is very important that everyone listening right now and everyone hearing the recording contact Father Andrew by any means at your disposal <laughs> and ask to pre-order the book because I've heard they might run out. I don't want to panic anybody, but I've heard. <laughs> I, hear, I hear things. I thank hear things. you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, thank no you problem. so much for that. All right, well, before we get to the third half of our show, we uh, have a question, uh, a call coming in from Aaron, who has a question about the Sea of Reeds. So, Aaron, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome to the Lord of Spirits, Aaron. We are really happy to have you. What is your question or comment for us tonight? Okay, so there is this common story with the Greeks and the Egyptians about this watery abyss that people have to travel through in order to get to wherever it is they get to. Now that Christ has uh, raided Hades and taken all of the souls out of there, both good and bad, damned and the righteous, um, I want to know where we fall into that now as Orthodox. We believe that there's this 40-day period where we pray for the soul, um, I wonder if that is there if there's some kind of like parallel there, the forty days that happens that we pray for the departed and this previous notion of having to kind of go through this intermediate phase on our way to Hades four. And if that whatever the answer may be, how that applies to both Orthodox and non Christians <laughs> and what you can make of that question. Okay. Well, I, I have some ideas, but I know that Father Stephen has much more coherent ideas about this because we've talked about it. So I'm going to punt on over to Lafayette, Louisiana. Okay. Well, uh, if you're trying to get me to talk about toll houses, you done messed up <laughs> a Ron. I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I just wanted to make the key and peel joke. Anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, a couple things. Um, First of all, uh, Christ only got the righteous out of Hades. Right. Um, this is this is a place where uh, our English translations fail us a little because you're you're probably thinking of a lot of our hymnography will talk about like with himself he has raised up all the dead, right? And you're like, well, that that sounds like all the dead, right? <laughs> that sounds like everybody. Um, but uh, one of the tricksy things hidden uh, in St. Paul's Greek is that he puts a definite article in front of the word necros sometimes, and sometimes he doesn't. Uh, so when St. Paul uses the word necros, dead, right, <laughs> the noun dead, uh, without the article, right, without what we would call a the, right, without an article, he's referring to just everyone who's dead, right, dead people in general. When St. Paul puts the definite article in front of it, so it's the dead, um, capital T, capital D, he's referring to departed Christians. He's referring to the departed faithful. And he distinguishes that very carefully. And so in our hymnography, when you, when you hear like he has raised up all the dead, it's all the dead, right? It's all the faithful. It's the, the, the Old Testament saints. So he brings them to paradise. The others remain in Hades. Um, so, uh, but to the, the main, the main thrust of your, of your question, um, we do believe, and there, there is no, you know, there are theories which I won't go into more detail on, uh, but there is no sort of dogmatic structured way of looking at uh, the sort of 40 day journey that a soul takes on its way to paradise or Hades to await the resurrection. Um, we know that there is a 40 day period because that's part of the experience of the faithful that's been handed down to us. Um, how exactly that works, we don't know. Uh, we probably can't know because, so, you know, you don't know what it's like to be a bat. You also don't know what it's like to be a disembodied human soul. Uh, that's, right. And, yeah. and how that, you know, I mean, our experience of time and space and everything is related to our material bodies. So without that, what, how has that experience change? We don't know. We'll find out. Um, 
but that there is that period uh, and that there is that journey uh, that on that journey the the faithful Christians are are protected by and guided by their guardian angel and by angels um, that there are demons involved going the other way um, we have those kind of things but there's no sort of very firm detailed thing um, related to that. Um, now, of course, that would mean that in our understanding before Christ's harrowing of Hades, everyone was going to the same place. Different parts, as we talked about last time, different parts of the same place, but the same place. Um, and that's why the language that you get in the Old Testament prophets is all about uh, you know, the Lord will not abandon my soul to Hades or to the Sheol. Yeah. Right. Meaning I'm going to go there, but even when I go there, God will still be with me and he will not leave me there. Right. That there will be some rescue coming, which is the prophetic element that points to the reality of the harrowing of Hades. But so now, um, there are different quote unquote places. Of course, we're using the term place metaphorically, right? Cause, yeah. Uh, where, wherever Christ is, that is paradise. So when Christ is in our midst in the liturgy, that is paradise. And that means that all of the saints and all of the faithful departed are there with us. Yep. <clears throat> Does that answer your question, Aaron? Yeah, it gives me a lot more questions, but yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. So this, is not easy, this is not easy. This is not easy stuff. Yeah. So Bill will kind of have a kingdom down there in his, uh, you know, because when Christ returns and we're all with him. Well, no, they're going to. I was going to. They're going to get dumped in the lake of fire. That's when Hades gets emptied out. Oh, yikes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll we'll yeah, we'll probably talk about all that horrible horrible stuff in a future episode. <laughs> we like to say that a lot, but it's true. It's true. We so, love horrible things. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to talk about it. <laughs> so, all right, well, thank you very much for calling Aaron. It was a a, a privilege to have you on the show tonight. Thanks, fathers. All Bye. right. Good night. All right. Well, for our third half, the smack talk continues. Um, now, now, uh, again, <clears throat> we're connecting with stuff that everybody should know who's Orthodox and goes to church in Holy Week and Pascha because you're going to go to every single service you can um, this next week. There is, of course, one of the very most memorable moments is the Paschal Sermon of St. John Chrysostom. And as it gets towards the end, he quotes from 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And it turns out that that actually is a quote from Hosea 13. <laughs> um, although a little bit reworded, what's going on there in Hosea chapter 13 that, that uh, St. Paul is quoting in it in 1 Corinthians 15? Yeah. Yeah, specifically Hosea 13, verse 14. Verse 14, yes. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think more people have read 1 Corinthians than Hosea for some reason. Um, yeah, which I, but, like, Hosea is awesome, people, by the way. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it, it is beautiful is. and not long. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm going to give my own translation of Hosea 13, verse 14, because they're all over the place. Um, yes, I looked this up and I was like, what? What? <laughs> What? <laughs> yes. And part of this is because uh, what we're going to bring out tonight here in the third half is that there are a bunch of proper names, specifically proper names of, uh, to uh, quote Winston, or to paraphrase Winston Zedmore, moldy old Canaanite gods, uh, <laughs> who are uh, mentioned here. And so what happens is most translations you pick up are not going to translate them as the names of these Canaanite gods, but are just going to try to translate them as words. Right. And so you get a variety of interesting things. Right. right. So like, for instance, if, <laughs> if, 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 if my name were in an ancient text and they, they did that, it would, it would not say Andrew Stephen. It would say, you know, manly crown, which would make yeah. no sense. <laughs> or the crowned man. They'll, they'll try yeah. to make sense of it. Right. The crowned right. man. The crown. Who's this crowned man? No, it's, it's Andrew right. Stephen. <laughs> So yeah, so um, this is the this is the De Young standard version 
of Hosea yes, chapter yes. 13. I don't know 15. that it's standardized, really. It's kind of the, <laughs> the young intuitive uh, version. <laughs> Provisional. I won't stand right. by it. Anyway, um, so 13, Hosea thirteen fourteen is roughly, uh, I will ransom, the, ransom them from the hand of Sheol. I will redeem them from Moat. O Moat, where is Deber? O Sheol, where is Keteb? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. And uh, we'll just leave it there. That's I think that makes uh, sense. To <laughs> that makes total sense, everybody. That's, Good night. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so a lot of times, for example, this is similar to something we were just talking about, the Song of the Sea. That first part where it talks about the hand of Sheol, they'll say like the power of the grave. Yeah. Because they're they're translating Yad, their hand, as sort of, well, that means might or power, and Sheol means the grave. Right. Uh, but of course, Sheol is not just the grave. It's also a place and it's also personified uh, right. either as a god or a, a, and or as sort of a creature with a big gaping mouth. Right. Yes. It's like swallowing. Lots, yeah. Yeah. Swallowing Lots of iconography the has the big mouth of hell. <laughs> right. The hell Sheol mouth. or Hades or right. The big mouth. Um, so. This is this is Yahweh saying, I will ransom them from the hand of Sheol. So if we think about the, this personification, this is an actual hand, a grip, right? They're being held, right? These people are being held by Sheol. And then in parallel with it, because this is how Hebrew poetry works, right? You have this these parallelisms. So that's parallel, that ransoming them from the hand of Sheol is paralleled with, I will redeem them from moat. Moat. Which is then translated into Greek as Thanatos, which is also the name of a god. Right. Um, and for Arabic speakers, you know the word al-maut, right? That's death, you know, but it's not just death, it's Moat, the god of death. Right. Yeah. This is this is the one who Baal was tangling with earlier when he totally victoriously went to the underworld. <laughs> um, so, right. so, uh, it's not just that, well, I'm going to uh, redeem them from death in some allegorical or metaphorical sense, but yeah. Moat, the god of death who rules this realm, has them, and I'm going to come get them, right? Right. And so right. then, right, and this makes sense when in the next sentence, O Moat, where Yahweh, the god of Israel, speaks to death. Again, this isn't an allegorical thing. He's talking to Moat. Right? The God of death, the Lord of the dead. And he says to him, where is Deber? <laughs> right? And then he talks to Sheol and says, oh, Sheol, where is Keteb? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. So, right. so, so who's Deber and who's Keteb? Right. He's asking Mote and Sheol where these other two people are. Right? <laughs> where these other two beings are. Right. And this, this is the part that, that parallels then... First Corinthians fifteen fifty five. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Right, and so, and uh, you see this pairing, by the way, of right of death and Sheol, of Thanatos and Hades, also in uh, Revelation uh, six verse eight, the last, okay. uh, the last of the four horsemen. Is yes, death and Hades follows with him. Right, right. So he's a horseman. These are again personified. In the inevitable Four Horsemen episode, we'll talk about how all four of the Four Horsemen are moldy old Canaanite gods uh, in the book of, of Revelation. Right. But um, so these two are paired there. The idea is that death sort of feeds Hades, right? Hades is this creature with this maw. He's this beast who follows death. Right. And death sort of feeds people to him. Right. Mm. He's sort of the rancor keeper. Right. Who's throwing the. <laughs> right. That was unexpected. That was. Yes. Crazy. So he's throwing. The... He's uh, Bosco. Throwing, feeding, feeding the people. OK. So Who is the job of the hut in this scenario. Yeah. <laughs> That's Damn, what I, I guess. guess. I don't know. There we go. Okay, um, all right. All right. So uh, Bib Fortuna, we won't go there anyway. So. Um, Deborah oh, and Keteb then are the okay. servants of Moat, right? Deborah and Keteb are also Canaanite gods uh, who right. are mentioned a whole bunch of places. 
uh, when their names are translated, they're usually translated as pestilence and plague. Mm. Uh, so you may already be thinking about the Four Horsemen again. Um, but the idea is that these two sort of work for and accompany Moat, right? So mm. Moat wants to feed Sheol, and he does that by sending his boys round, <laughs> right? Uh, Deber and Keteb, who are going to go out there, plague and pestilence, and kill people. Right, kill people with famine, kill people with disease, kill people. Right. Then Moat gets a hold of them, feeds them to Sheol, feeds them to Hades, feeds them to hell. Right, and right. We see that accompaniment idea in Habakkuk three verse fourteen, and I know everyone has read Habakkuk if they mm. haven't read Hosea. <laughs> um, but Habakkuk three is actually the fourth biblical ode. We're going through a lot of the biblical odes. <laughs> That's tonight. Yeah. Um, and in that, uh, it describes uh, Deborah and Keteb as sort of part of this posse. And this wasn't just a thing with Moat uh, in Canaanite thinking. This was also a thing with Marduk. Uh, this and he was, is Babylonian. Uh, yeah, the, who is the Babylonian Baal, essentially. He's the one who went and took out his parents and <laughs> took over uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Uh, so, so, and Marduk had, uh, Nergal, uh, you know, he had his posse who went out and, and killed for him. But, uh, in Habakkuk three, which is also smack talk, it's talking about how Yahweh actually has Deborah and Keteb in his entourage, that mm. he's the one it's Yahweh, the God of Israel who has control over pestilence and plague. Yeah. Which and then this connects us with this theme we've seen before, which is that these these afflictions, right, these demonic afflictions that are loose in the world, you know, they obviously have their own agenda, but ultimately they are, to use St. Gregory, the great's language, the left hand of God. You know, they right. are the, 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 the demons, they're doing their will, but ultimately still they're doing the will of the Lord, who is trying to bring people to repentance. That's the whole the whole point right and so none of these pagan gods could be appeased in order to protect you from plague or pestilence right they're yeah. not the ones who wield them they're not the ones who who have uh control over them right. uh we also see uh keteb shows up in the second ode second biblical ode in deuteronomy 32 uh he shows up there with reshef who we'll find out in that inevitable episode is one of the four horsemen mm -hmm. um who is a guy who shoots arrows of plague. There's actually a, a, a very early Chthonic uh, version of Apollo, who's basically Reshef, brought over into, into Greek mm -hmm. uh, thinking. Um, and in Deuteronomy 32, there Keteb is hanging out with Mo. Uh, How about that? <laughs> and then these folks also show up uh, in uh, Psalm 91 in the Hebrew numbering of the Psalms, 90 in the Greek, uh, numbering of the Psalms, verses 5 and 6. Uh, and if you've been to any of the great Compline services uh, in uh, Lent uh, or at the Orthodox Church, or if you uh, go to Sixth Hour, you'll also hear about this, both in the prayers uh, and in the reading of the Psalm. But in verse 5 and 6, if you translate the names as names, uh, it refers to Deber, who walks in darkness, and Keteb, who destroys at noon. Right. Or as probably most of us have heard, the demon who walks in the dark darkness and, the, and the, the, the demon of noonday or something like that. Right. The noonday demon. Right. And doesn't, does, doesn't that get read also in, um, in the funeral? Right. Isn't it, isn't this the yes. psalm that's at the beginning of the funeral? Yes. They were actually is... asking God to save this person from Deber and Keteb. Right. This is... There were, in the Second Temple period in Judaism, we find these, for example, in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were six d psalms that were considered Davidic psalms of exorcism hmm. that David wrote to be sung over someone who was demon-possessed in order to exorcise them. This is the only one of them that's a canonical psalm. The other five are not canonical. But So this was an exorcism psalm from very early. and. Wow from as far back as we know, was used at Orthodox funerals as well. So um, you've got exorcisms at baptism, and now an exorcism again at the funeral. Yeah. And, uh, and by the way, the reason it's translated as Demon of Noonday is that the Greek translators of 
uh, what was for them Psalm 90, realized this that this that these were proper names, and so they translated mm. it. They didn't say the plague that destroys at noon. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. They said the demon who destroys at noonday, right? Yeah, the noonday the demon, because they realized what it was referring to. Mm. Um, and also in that psalm, the arrows that fly by day is reference to Reshef again, who we mentioned earlier. But yeah, uh, as an aside, so the the idea here in uh, in when we piece together Habakkuk, when we when we look at What's going on in Hosea is that uh, God has disarmed, has disarmed death, right? The God of death, these weapons that he thought he had, right, have been taken away from him and God now has them. And so he's literally in Hosea sort of taunting him, right? He's like, hey, hey, death, where's, where's your boy, uh, Deborah? Uh, where, where's he? Oh, he's over here with me. Oh, uh, where's... <laughs> Where's where's Ketet? Oh yeah, he's here. He's here with me too. <laughs> right. You're all yeah. alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 And you know, another thing I wanted to mention um, as we've been kind of moving along this, uh, I, I, you know, so we, okay, you've got this line from Chrysostom's homily where he's quoting First Corinthians fifteen: "O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, hell, or O oh, grave, or Hades, whatever, where is thy victory?" That's what this is referring to. It's talking directly to these demons and saying that their power is being has been stripped from them. But at the same time, there's another liturgical connection. If you understand these references to Moat, to the God of death, right? So if you sing the Paschal Apolitikion, Christ is risen from the dead, if you sing it in Greek, Christos anestiek nekron thanato thanaton patisas, that means so we translate it as you know trampling down death by death, but it's but a, a more um, a, a clear reading of that might be trampling down Thanatos, the god of death, by the means of death. That's what's going on there. And of course, if you sing it in Arabic, you know you've got Maut al Bamaut, right? So again, Maut, the god of death, being trampled down by means of death. That's so that when demon with yeah. the door on his face. Right, the demon that his door, <laughs> whose face is smashed in by the door when the Lord <laughs> busts his way into Hades. Right, so, so you know, like when you sing, so next week you're going to sing this, this hymn, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. When you get to that line, trampling down death by death, understand what you're singing, that Christ is smashing the God of death by means of his own death his own entrance into hades right and this yeah. this idea of disarmament and stripping of power is exactly what saint paul does with it in first corinthians yeah. and you have to understand this to understand what he's doing because what he says immediately after quoting hosea is he says now the sting of death is the law which is sort of like wait what like where did that come from right because he's mm. talking about the resurrection Right. But if you think about this, the imagery we have here that Jose is working with is that death is laying claim to people. Right. Through through plague and pestilence, right through his minions, it's laying claim to people and, and dragging them to, to Hades, to Sheol. Right. That's what death is doing. Right. So for St. Paul, how is. How is uh, the devil laying claim to people and dragging them into Sheol, into Hades, into death? Yeah. Through sin, right? Through sin, through the violation of the law, right? But the law, the Torah, for St. Paul, is not evil. It's neutral. And so Christ has taken it back and has now made the commandments, has now made, made the Torah something which gives life instead of death. This is one of St. Paul's ongoing themes. So he's using it in the same disarmament sense. And then he, he makes that quite literally plain in Hebrews chapter 2, um, if you want to read that. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so in Hebrews 2, verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
pretty direct. <laughs> right, right. Well, that is the third half of our show, and um, Father Stephen is going to give his uh, closing remarks, and then I, I have something to share with you. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to wish all of you a very, very powerful Holy Week and Pascha coming up. Um, and uh, our, our next episode, is, which will be again, this, it'll be the second Thursday of May, so it's going to be three weeks from today if you're listening to us live, uh, is going to be a Q&A episode where we're just going to hammer one question after another. So, uh, you know, especially if you've called in and, and, and uh, you know, your, your question wasn't directly applicable or we couldn't answer it tonight, uh, you know, call in for that time and we'd, we'd love to talk to you. So, all right, Father Stephen, your final thoughts. Yeah. Well, people may or may not have noticed I didn't make as many uh, pop song references tonight. <laughs> uh, that's because Father and Andrew and I had a discussion. Do you, do you remember this discussion, Father Andrew? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Well, we had we had this discussion because I, I made a reference to Screaming Trees and I, I nearly lost you. And uh, so then I was like, <laughs> well, can I make like a space hog or a helmet reference in the meantime? No. And you were like, no. <laughs> no. But then, then you suggested that I make an oasis reference and i said maybe <laughs> i said maybe oh. um but uh 90 oh, percent of kidding aside again um thank you so i i think uh though it may not seem so at first i i think an important thread running through what we talked about tonight not directly related to holy week and pasca is the issue of what sometimes gets called the problem of evil um, specifically the way it takes the form of the problem of suffering in the world. Um, even though we've talked about one element of it that we came to again tonight, the idea that these evil powers are indeed evil, but are not outside of God's control, that God has control of them and God can ultimately use, use them to bring about his will and to bring about good. He can bring good out of evil. That's what God does. Uh, but another important aspect of that is something that we just sort of touched on when we talked about the Song of the Sea. And that's the idea that, uh, as Father Andrew said, you know, God doesn't take them around the sea. <laughs> he doesn't take them around death. Uh, he doesn't just sort of swoop down and strike Pharaoh and his armies dead on land. He doesn't, you know, break all their chariots so they can't catch up with the Israelites. He doesn't spare them from danger. He doesn't spare them from the experience of death. And I think often when we look at our lives and when we look at our prayer lives and when we, we interact with God prayerfully, uh, we treat it as if God is supposed to spare us from sorrow and spare us from pain and spare us from death and when these things enter our lives, we act like they're these weird foreign intruders. And why is God doing this to me? Or why is God allowing this to happen to me? And we've got it exactly backwards, right? Because the sorrow and suffering and pain and struggle and sin in our lives uh, is a foreign invader to God's creation, but it's not a foreign invader to our lives and to our consciousness because we continually invite and bring it in and bring it about and cause it where God intervenes is not to stop us from choosing it, not to stop us from bringing it into our lives, but to graciously bring us through it and out the other side to something better. God isn't going to stop us from suffering. He's not going to make us immortal so we never die on this earth. He's not going to make it so we never get sick. He's not going to make it so we never suffer loss or hardship or any of those things, right? All those things are in the world because of us. But what God is going to do, what he's promised to do, and what he is actively doing is bringing us through all of those things and out the other side uh, to light and to peace and to joy and to life uh, that is eternal uh, with him, not to some kind of shadowy existence, uh, but to rule and reign with Christ uh, for eternity. And so that is, that is the promise. That is where our joy as Christians in suffering can come from. That's why Lent is a bright struggle, not just a struggle. That's why all of our efforts 
uh, can be conducted with joy because uh, as the psalm says uh, that uh, we read at the end of the pre-sanctified liturgies we've been having in Lent, many are the tribulations of the righteous man, but the Lord will deliver him from them all. Well, to close, I want to share with you one of my favorite passages of anything that I've ever read. So this comes from a text that is called the Gospel of Nicodemus. And um, it is, as far as I know, I think it's a dated generally to the fourth century. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it, it comes out of traditions that are certainly older than that. <clears throat> and there's a portion of the Gospel of Nicodemus that the best way that I can understand how to describe it would be that you know, there's all these things that we go through together, for instance, during Holy Week, and this is what's described in the Gospels, right? And, you know, Christ's passion, his suffering, his death, so his resurrection. Well, there's a portion of the Gospel of Nicodemus that's called um, the descent into hell. And uh, it's probably best described as what's going on down in the underworld while all these other things are happening uh, on, on earth, Okay, and right before the passage I'm about to read to you, um, hell and Satan are having a conversation. So, you know, we've been talking about a whole bunch of these various gods, right? So you think of this as, as uh, you know, Moat and uh, Sheol, you know, having a conversation or Satan and hell, you know, however you want to talk about it, right? There's just different names for these these beings. And uh, and it's being set up so that Satan is basically saying, uh, you know, hell, open up your gates because, um, I'm bringing Jesus in here. You know, we, we got him. We finally got him, right? The devil thinks he's finally got him. So they're having this conversation. It's going back and forth and, uh, it picks up right here. Hell answered and said, Thou hast told me that it is he that ta hath taken away dead men from me. For there be many which, while they lived on the earth, have taken dead men from me, yet not by their own power, but by prayer to God. And their almighty God hath taken them from me. Who is this Jesus, which by his own word, without prayer, hath drawn dead men from me? Perchance it is he which by the word of his command did restore to life Lazarus, which was four days dead and stank and was corrupt, whom I held here dead. Satan, the prince of death, answered and said, It is that same Jesus. When hell heard that, he said unto him, I adjure thee by the strength and mine own, that thou bring him not unto me. For at that time I, when I heard the command of his word, did quake and was overwhelmed with fear, and all my ministries with me were troubled. Neither could we keep Lazarus. But he, like an eagle shaking himself, leaped forth with all agility and swiftness and departed from us. And the earth also, which held the dead body of Lazarus, straightway gave him up alive. Wherefore, now I know that that man, which was able to do these things, is a God strong in command and mighty in manhood, and that he is the savior of mankind. And if thou bring him unto me, he will set free all that are here shut up in the hard prison and bound in the chains of their sins that cannot be broken and will bring them unto the life of his Godhead forever. And as Satan the prince and hell spoke this together, suddenly there came a voice as of thunder and a spiritual cry. Remove, O princes, your gates and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. When hell heard that, he said unto Satan the prince, Depart from me, and go out of mine abode. If thou be a mighty man of war, fight thou against the king of glory. But what hast thou to do with him? And hell cast Satan forth out of his dwelling. Then said hell unto his wicked ministers, Shut ye the hard gates of brass, and put on them the bars of iron, and withstand stoutly, lest we that hold captivity be taken captive. But when all the multitude of the saints heard it, they spake with a voice of rebuking unto hell, Open thy gates that the king of glory may come in. And David cried out, crying, cried out, saying, 
Did I not, when I was alive upon earth, foretell unto you, let them give thanks unto the Lord, even his mercies and his wonders unto the children of men, who hath broken the gates of brass and smitten the bars of iron in sunder? He hath taken them out of the way of their iniquity. And thereafter, in like manner, Isaiah said, Did not I, when I was alive upon earth, foretell unto you, the dead shall arise, and they that are in the tombs shall rise again? And they that are in the earth shall rejoice, for the dew which cometh of the Lord is their healing. And again I said, O death, where is thy sting? O hell, where is thy victory? When they heard that of Isaiah, all the saints said unto hell, Open thy gates, now shalt thou be overcome, and weak and without strength. And there came a great voice as of thunder, saying, Remove, O princes, your gates, and be lift up, ye doors of hell, and the king of glory shall come in. And when hell saw that they so cried out twice, he said, as if he knew it not, Who is this king of glory? And David answered hell and said, The words of this cry do I know, for by his spirit I prophesied the same. And now I say unto thee that which I said before, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, he is the king of glory. And the Lord looked down from heaven that he might hear the groanings of them that are in fetters and deliver the children of them that have been slain. And now, O thou most foul and stinking hell, open thy gates, that the king of glory may come in. And as David thus spake unto hell, the Lord of majesty appeared in the form of a man and lightened the eternal darkness and brake the bonds that could not be loosed. And the succor of his everlasting might visited us that sat in the deep darkness of our transgressions and in the shadow of death of our sins. When hell and death and their wicked ministers saw that, they were stricken with fear. They and their cruel officers, at the sight of the brightness of so great light in their own realm, seeing Christ of a sudden in their abode, and they cried out, saying, We are overcome by thee. Who art thou that art sent by the Lord for our confusion? Who art thou that without all damage of corruption and with the signs of thy majesty unblemished dost in wrath condemn our power? Who art thou that art so great and so small, both humble and exalted, both soldier and commander, a marvelous warrior in the shape of a bondsman, and a king of glory, dead and living, whom the cross bears slain upon it? Thou that didst lie dead in the sepulchre hast come down unto us living, And at thy death all creation quaked, and all the stars were shaken, and thou hast become free among the dead, and dost rout our legions. Who art thou that settest free the prisoners that are held bound by original sin, and restorest them into their former liberty? Who art thou that sheddest thy divine and bright light upon them that were blinded with the darkness of their sins? After the same manner all the legions of devils were stricken with like fear and cried out all together in the terror of their confusion, saying, Whence art thou, Jesus, a man so mighty and bright in majesty, so excellent without spot and clean from sin? For that world of earth which hath been always subject unto us until now, and did pay tribute to our prophet, hath never sent unto us a dead man like thee, nor ever dispatched such a gift unto hell. Who then art thou that so fearlessly enterest our borders, and not only fearest not our torments, but besides essayest to bear away all men out of our bonds? Peradventure thou art that Jesus, of whom Satan our prince said, that by thy death of the cross thou shouldst receive the dominion of the whole world. Then did the king of glory in his majesty trample upon death and laid hold on Satan the prince, and delivered him unto the power of hell, and drew Adam to him unto his own brightness. And that is our show for today. Thank you for listening. If you didn't get a chance to call in during the live broadcast, we would love to hear from you, either via email at lordofspiritsandancientfaith.com, or you can message us at our Lord of Spirits podcast Facebook page, We read everything, but we can't respond to everything. We do save what you send for possible use in future episodes. Fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And if you're on Facebook, like our page and join our discussion group, leave reviews and ratings everywhere. But most importantly, do what I know a lot of you are doing. Share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it. 
If you join our Facebook group now, you can be sworn as a, as a space monkey before Project Mayhem begins. And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com slash support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. Thank you very much. God bless you, and may he give you a bright and glorious Pascha. You've been listening to The Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. Archpriest Gordon T. Walker served God for his entire life. From his childhood as a Baptist in Alabama, through years as a Protestant pastor, and finally, after decades of searching for the true church, as an Orthodox priest. One of the founding leaders of the former Evangelical Orthodox Church, Father Gordon had a special heart for youth and founded Grace Ministries to facilitate serving them. In the course of his ministry, he touched hundreds of lives with the boundless love and grace of God. This memoir, compiled and edited after his repose by his brother Philip Walker, reveals the servant heart of a dedicated man of God. Even back then, I remember him saying, you know, we need to find the New Testament church. We need to follow the example of the New Testament church. To find this book and others like it, you can go to store.ancientfaith.com. Again, that is store.ancientfaith.com. Welcome to the Thursday edition of The Path. You're connected to The Path, offering strength for our journey towards salvation. Here's Father Tom Soroka. Today's first reading is from Genesis, chapter 46, verses 1 through 7. Now Israel took his journey with all he had, and came to the well of Oath, and offered a sacrifice to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in a vision of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. So he said, Here I am. So God said to him, I am the God of your fathers. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Then Jacob arose from the well of Oath, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their baggage, and their wives in the carts Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed he brought with him to Egypt. St. John Chrysostom reminds us that Israel, Jacob, was faithful to God's promise. He writes, See how whatever the good man longed for, the Lord promises him, and in fact, much more. That is to say, in his generosity, he exceeds our requests out of fidelity to his characteristic love. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, he says, because Jacob dreaded the length of the journey Accordingly, he says, Have no regard for the weakness of your old age. I will make you into a great nation there. I will accompany you and make everything easy for you. Notice the considerateness of the expression, I will go down with you to Egypt. What could be more blessed than to have God as a traveling companion? Then he spoke the consoling thought that the old man had particular need of Joseph's hands will close your eyes in death. That dearly beloved son of yours will personally prepare your body for burial, and his hands will close your eyes in death. So, 
quite happy and free from all concern, Jacob took to the road. Consider at this point, I ask you, with what cheerfulness the good man makes the journey, being so reassured by God's promise. Today's second reading is from Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 15, through chapter 24, verse 5. My son, if your heart becomes wise, you will also gladden my heart, and your lips shall spend time with the words on my lips. If they be upright, do not let your heart envy sinners, but be in fear of the Lord the whole day long. For if you keep these words, you shall have offspring, and your hope will not depart from you. Hear, my son, and become wise, and direct aright the thoughts of your heart. Do not be a wine-bibber, neither provide contributions of meats or goods at drinking parties. For every drunkard and fornicator shall become impoverished, and every sluggard shall clothe himself with tattered and ragged garments. Hear, my son, your father who begot you, and do not despise your mother because she has grown old. A righteous father rears his child well, and his soul rejoices in a wise son. Let your father and mother be glad in you, and let her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes observe my ways. For a house of prostitution is a pierced vessel, and a strange and empty well. For he shall perish suddenly, and every lawless man shall be destroyed. Who has woe? Who has tumult? Who has condemnation? Who has unpleasantness and gossip? Who has afflictions with no purpose? Whose eyes are pale? Is it not those who linger long with wines? Is it not those who hunt for the whereabouts of drinking parties? Do not be drunk with wine, but keep company with righteous men, and keep company in public walks. For if you set your eyes to the bowls and cups, afterward you will walk about more naked than ground meat. And at last he stretches himself out as one bitten by a serpent, and the venom spreads throughout him as one bitten by a horned serpent. When your eyes behold a strange woman, then your mouth will speak twisted things, and you will lie down as in the heart of the sea, and as a pilot in a great storm. And you will say, They beat me, but I did not suffer, and they mocked me, but I knew it not. When will it be morning, that I may go seek those with whom I may company? My son, do not envy evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart ponders a lie, and their lips speak of sufferings. A house is built with wisdom, and it is built up with understanding. Storehouses are filled with perception from all honorable and good riches. It is better to be a wise man of strength and a man having discernment than to be a man who has a large estate. We are reminded in today's reading from Proverbs to give wisdom and every good thing our heart. The Blessed Augustine writes, If you don't give yourself, you will lose yourself. Charity herself speaks through wisdom and tells you something to save you from panicking at being told, Give yourself. If anyone wanted to sell you a farm, he would say to you, Give me your gold. And if it was something else, Give me your coppers. Give me your silver. Now listen to what charity says to you, speaking through the mouth of wisdom. Give me your heart, son. Give me, she says. Give her what? Your heart, son. It was ill when it was with you, when you kept it to yourself. You were being pulled this way and that by toys and trifles and wanton, destructive loves. Take your heart away from all that. Where are you to drag it to? Where are you to put it? Give me your heart, she says. Let it be mine, and it won't be lost to you. Remember that you can download all of the daily messages by visiting our website at ancientfaithradio.com and clicking on The Path. We'd also love to hear from you. You can write us at The Path at ancientfaithradio.com. That's The Path at ancientfaithradio.com. 
Now, here with some final thoughts is Father Tom. As we grow very close to the end of the great fast, the Church reminds us to give ourselves entirely over to God. Israel trusted in the promises of God. Wisdom cries out to us to give our hearts. Let us do so, so that we may behold the resurrection of the Lord. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is a daily presentation on Ancient Faith Radio. You are listening to The Morning Offering with Abbot Trifon. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill among men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee. The Mystery of the Church There is a certain emptiness in trying to live the Christian life outside the life of the Church. This is because it is impossible to truly live as a Christian without the Church. The reading of the Scriptures and our commitment to prayer are important foundations in the life of a Christian, but they are incomplete without the mystical and sacramental life that is found within the Church. If we hope to grow spiritually, we will take advantage of the mystery that is found only within the church. Without the mystery of penance and the absolution of the church, we have no hope of transformation and holiness, for without the corporate life of the church, our sins keep us captive. Without the mystery of Christ's body and blood received during the celebration of the Church's divine liturgy, the healing of the soul remains undone, and salvation is next to impossible. The center of the Church's Eucharistic liturgy is to be found in the descent, the appearance, and the divine presence of the resurrected Christ and is central to every moment of the liturgy. As believers, the partaking 